these, the outcome of these practices will not only impact the Western world, they will, to a much more profound extent, affect the global south, which has far less greenhouse emissions than other parts of the world. In the US, our excessive use of plastics, our dependency on fossil fuels, the lack of proper public systems of transportation across the wide expanses of our country means that citizens of food insecure countries, such as the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, will not only be dealing with rising temperatures, but also with floods and droughts that will affect the vitamin and mineral composition of their crops and thereby the nutritional health of their communities for years to come. So the lack of proper nutrition is really just not about hunger. It's also about physical, neurological, and intellectual development, all of which will be impacted by human-induced climate change. And we in the Western world must realize that we're partly, if not wholly, to blame for these issues. While this news alone should be enough to jar us out of the apathetic attitude that seemingly accompanies life in late capitalism, let's take a step further. And remember that on November 4th, 2020, just a few months from now, the United States will no longer be part of the UN's Paris Agreement, which is the concerted effort by countries belonging to the United Nations to help reduce greenhouse emissions. The United States by and large is one of the greatest environmental offenders, yet in the fall of this year, it will remove itself from the program of global peer accountability. Is this a political failing? Absolutely. Is this a moral failing? Most assuredly. Late capitalism and neoliberalism are complicit in the demise of our planet. The effects of these social processes on our planet are not just felt now, they're historically embedded into the systems of power. With imperialism, capitalism, and industrialization came the destructive shaping forces of what we call progress that have not only contoured the terrain, but also our very lives and ways of being in the world. Slavery, the commodification of the human body, the plantation system, the extractive exploitative practices of large scale productivity and manufacturing shaped and continue to shape areas of the world, such as India, the Caribbean, and Central and South America, just to name a few. All of these practices have found new incarnations and new iterations in late capitalism and all have a hand in the decline of our planet. We must be aware that environmentalism and ecological crises are not isolated from other systemic issues that continue to plague us, including racism, classism, issues of human rights, healthcare, access to universal healthcare, poverty, gender inequality. These are intersecting issues that require both scientific and theological intervention, and not just in a theoretical sense. This intervention must be practical, active, lived, and consistent. When we talk about large-scale issues of environmentalism, there's often a disconnect between theory, the ideas we have, and practice, how we implement those ideas in our everyday lives. And in the church, there's often a disconnect between theology, the truths we hold, and practice, how we live out that theology intentionally and intersectionally. And when I talk about engaging in ecological practices, theological or otherwise, I do so from a social perspective, an embodied, embedded perspective that is mindful of how our individual and collective actions affect others. I do so as an anthropologist who believes each of us has a responsibility to each other and to this world to act in real concrete and practical ways that can be measured scientifically and supported theologically. I do so as someone who's looking for an engaged Orthodox theology of the Anthropocene. Certainly or Eastern Orthodoxy possesses a robust theological imagination and nowhere is that more evident than the writings on environmentalism ecology and repair, as Chris noted at the beginning of this. Yet the practicality of our rich theologies of ecology is often lacking. Unlike many religious communities with active on the ground practices of ecological renewal, we've yet to turn our theories into methods that have deep social and environmental effects. This is where anthropology can provide an intervention for us. It can get us out of that headspace of ego theology and into the deep ecological work that's needed for the transfiguration of ourselves and the world. Anthropology, and think about that root anthropos, pushes us to recognize the human impact on climate change and other environmental crises. Our spiritual recognition of our human ecological failings must be combined with our concerted efforts for social and environmental change. 
however difficult or however messy it may be. While Eastern Orthodoxy certainly has a bevy of green thinkers, it has far fewer folks who are interested in greening our world. An engaged theology of the Anthropocene requires saying and doing. So let's look a little bit at what Orthodox ecotheology, some of it says, before we can think about how we can activate it in the world. Many of the early church fathers could be considered green thinkers, while not thought of as perhaps eco-theologians per se by contemporary Orthodox scholars. These early religious thinkers, many of them saints, wrote extensively about the cosmos, natural world, creation, and how divinity relates to materiality, how God relates to the earth. Often when contemporary Orthodox theologians discuss the importance of early church fathers and discourses on eco-theology, they turn to St. John of Damascus, who wrote extensively about iconography, veneration, and the incarnation of Christ. According to Eastern Orthodox Church tradition, St. John proclaimed that the whole earth is a living icon of God's faith. In his triad of treatises on the divine images on iconography, St. John often makes use of the work of other Christian thinkers, in particular, I'm thinking here of St. Um, Gregory the Theologian, to support his arguments about the visibility of the invisible God through the natural world. Stressing the importance of created things as images, reflections of the divine, and he's talking specifically about um, elements of the natural world. St. John highlights how all veneration of an image is directed to its prototype, it's directed to God. This connection between matter and spirituality, between creator and creation, is key in thinking not only about how we understand ourselves in relationship to each other and all living things, but how we can participate not in just care, the caretaking of creation, but in its perpetual renewal let us ask ourselves how we might different how we might differently manage our day-to-day -day lives if we took seriously the relationship that nature has to the divine. What might we avoid? Toxic chemicals, plastics, gas-guzzling cars. If we took this relationship more seriously, how might we invest our time and our resources and our very beings in meaningful and transformative ways that acknowledge the trauma we cause? not only to the earth, but to each other through our day-to-day -day seemingly mundane actions. Eastern Orthodox ideas about ecology and environmentalism often focus specifically on earth's trauma, renewal, and regeneration. This is seen most readily in the treatises issued by His Holiness, uh, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. In writings and lectures and speeches, excellent books, he stresses the importance of caring for God's creation, for reducing harm to plant the plant and animal kingdom. His ecological awareness and understanding of the moral shortcomings of humans is vital in building up a strong orthodox presence in both talks and works on ecological renewal. His all holiness who, because of his deep stance on ecological sustainability is often heralded by the press as the green patriarch, which I'm sure we've all seen, proclaims in his book on earth as it is in heaven, and I'm quoting him here, for our Orthodox Church, the protection of the environment as a divine and very good creation embodies a great responsibility for every human person, regardless of material or financial benefits. The direct correlation of God-given duty and mandate to work and preserve with every aspect of contemporary life constitutes the only way to a harmonious coexistence with each and every element of creation and the entirety of the natural world in general. His All Holiness offers a firm guiding voice for many, but not all, Orthodox communities, providing spiritual counsel regarding ways in which ecological sustainability can be approached through teaching and aesthetical practices. And while His All Holiness reminds Eastern Orthodox Christians of the moral and ethical implications of ignoring the facts of climate change, he generally offers very few prescriptive ideas for embodied action, for deep involvement in practical modes of sustainability. His work, like many other Orthodox theologians of ecology, is philosophical, it's theoretical, and it serves as a roadmap, but it's not the vehicle for change. There are many excellent Orthodox theologians who are discussing ecological issues, and today I want to briefly discuss two of them who I found really important in my own research. Dr. Elizabeth Theokritov and Father John Krasavides, the eco ecological advisor to His Holiness, the Patriarch Bartholomew. Both scholars offer theoretical, spiritual and philosophical modes for engaging in ecological issues. And their work is quite helpful. 
they give us a language for thinking about ecology in, in an orthodox key, to borrow a turn of phrase from the marvelous Armenian Orthodox scholar Vegan Gurren, who I, who I love dearly. Dr. Thea Kridoff has written about the lack of practical applicability when it comes to orthodox ecotheology, noting that most, if not all, scholars working in this area often suggest we just return to the readings of the fathers, think about the cosmic liturgy, and the ascetical endeavors to cultivate practices of self-sacrifice. But she says that's not enough, and that in her words, there's no room for complacency. Action is needed. Dr. Thea Kirtoff offers a voice of critique that we really, I really think we need if we're gonna have an engaged theology of the Anthropocene. Father John Krasavicki's work, which draws masterfully on St. John of Damascus, often reminds us of the importance of iconography and materiality in building an eco-theological paradigm of the earth and the natural world. He suggests in an essay from 2000, and I'm gonna quote him here, that the entire earth is an icon. The whole of creation constitutes an icon painted before the ages, an image eternally engraved by the unique iconographer of the word of God, namely the Holy Spirit. This image is never totally destroyed, never fully effaced, our aim is simply to reveal this image to the heart and to reflect it in the world. Yet the image itself, the icon is indelible for our world has been forever sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now this is a beautiful theological reading of planetary thought by Father John, focusing on the spiritual nature of the icon, in this case earth, rather than the material nature of the icon. But the earth, the physical matter of our planet, which is the icon of God will die because all matter dies. As Orthodox Christians, we pray for the dying, we pray for the dead. Who will pray for the earth once it dies? And more importantly and pressing, who will turn those prayers for our dying planet into work for its renewal before it withers away? If our theologies of planetary thinking of the cosmos understand all things to be filled with the Holy Spirit, iconographically depicting Christ, then what does that mean for the earth that we've quite frankly ruined? What does it mean for right-believing Orthodox Christians who deny climate change, deforestation, ocean acidification, and then they turn away from many more ecological crises that are happening before their very eyes because they're more concerned with politics than people. If the earth is an icon of God, we have marred the divine image. We have marred the icon with our participation in cultures of capitalism that prioritize money and things over animals, plants, and each other. We have marred the image through capitalistic ableism that doesn't allow for care work, self-care, or any type of respite for our physical, psychological, spiritual, or social needs. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought this to the fore in ways that are highly visible. Corporations send emails to parents working from home, letting them know they can't have their children visible on screen. Care work should be neither seen nor heard. And there's the assumption you should be paying someone else to do that type of kinship labor. Working from home was often not an option for those with health concerns and disabilities prior to the pandemic. But now, because it's the only econo economically feasible option for companies, it somehow works. The goal is always the hustle, 24 seven productivity both of which deprive us of time needed to rest and to assess the inequalities happening around us. We're too busy to think about climate change. We're too tired to find alternative energy solutions, and we are too economically stuck oftentimes to make large life changes for the betterment of ourselves, the planet. And this is for those of us who recognize the need for swift action and the need for change. The COVID-19 pandemic has also brought to the fore in the global Orthodox world, and I hope that Chris will speak to this after, but I, it's most assuredly happening in the Eastern Orthodox world, the very real and disturbing trend of science deniers and those who cannot accept the church's need to embrace our God-given intellect in matters of public health. Why do I bring this up? Because the, outline, the online outrage and on the ground pushback against health hygiene rules around church attendance around the Eucharist during the pandemic, our current expression of how many throughout the global Orthodox community do not understand and accept science and the need for change. COVID-19 has brought to the fore the inequalities of the healthcare system and basic human rights, while at the same time showing us in the church that by and large, Orthodox Christians are incapable of activating themselves for change. Just think about this. 
If some Eastern Orthodox Christians could not accept the use of multiple spoons at the Holy Chalice, masks during services, and regulations about choirs, then how? How can we expect them to accept the science behind many of these ecological crises? And here I'm thinking specifically of climate change. And how can we expect them to be motivated to participate in the practical ecological methods of conservation and renewal? This is not a rhetorical question. This is a serious question. It's a social question. It's a question that can't be answered only by theological means. It's an intersectional question that demands we think about the political nature of the individual, the collective, and I'm going to say it, the church. It demands that we set aside both ontological fears about the end of the day and Christian fatalism, both of which are present in many of the communities I work in, which are predominantly made up of converts, which is a whole nother story. It's doubtful we are living at the end of the world in an eschatological sense, but we are living at the end of a period of time in which humans have overextended both themselves and the natural resources of the planet. And it is in this time that many things we know and many things we love will come to an end. An engaged orthodox theology of the Anthropocene means more than simply taking the rich ecological thought found in the writings of the saints and theologians and applying them to our lives in practice. We're all capable of doing that, and we all do that on some level. An engaged theology of the Anthropocene means acknowledging and working to form the deeply flawed systems of power, privilege, and persecution that have been and continue to be part of the ecology of human life across this planet. These systems are not separated from orthodoxy. They are embedded in many instances. And Orthodox Christianity, as it is broadly constituted, is often knowingly and unknowingly complicit in these shaping social structures. Now, if you're still with me, here's part two. How should the church respond? There are already many movements in Eastern Orthodoxy, especially where I work in the United States, to somehow remove oneself from society, a la the Benedict Option, in its manifold variations. And by doing so, especially through the, the buzz phrase of intentional or slow living, become more sustainable, spiritually and ecologically. Certainly the desire to slow down, to subvert the frantic pace of capitalistic life and to find new ways to have smaller carbon footprints are to be applauded. At the same time, however, removing oneself from the problems that plague the collective is selfish. It doesn't fall in line with the orthodox emphasis on the sacrificial life that is focused on the transfiguration of ourselves for the other. Theocritus reminds us of this in her exceptional book, Living in God's Creation. She reminds us that each of us plays a role in the salvific work of pushing the kingdom forward. Our actions are part of the transfiguration of ourselves, the planet, and the cosmos. And she urges us to recall that it is in the ordinary, everyday decisions of our lives, how we engage engage with and treat others, what actions we take and what we turn away from, that the cosmic dimensions of the path to the kingdom are truly revealed. There are some practical applications of ecological theology that, or, that Orthodox Christianity, at least Eastern Orthodox Christianity, um, gets right. Liturgy, by and large, is ecologically friendly, right? Although in recent months, we've had to add some more paperwork and masks and because of the very wise measures taken to prevent the spread of the coronavirus and keep down the number of COVID patients. Our use generally of beeswax candles often dipped and poured by monastic communities, our hand painted icons crafted by iconographers in holistic, thoughtful and renewable ways, our use of reusable housing elements for the holy gifts and many more things are on the list that we get fundamentally right, but there's still a need for change. Frederick Kruger, who is the executive director of the Orthodox Fellowship of the Transfiguration and his practical guide to greening our parishes and our lives, reminds us of the fixes we can make. And if you don't have his book, I really encourage you to get it. Um, perhaps even form a digital reading group around it, um, work through the handbook in your parishes, on your parish council. Mm. It's really a helpful tool. There are so many practical fixes, switching from paper bulletins to digital, allowing parishioners to tithe online rather than mailing in their envelopes, avoiding toxic cleaning supplies in our parish, buying reusable cutlery, dinnerware, and kitchen items for coffee hour, no more styrofoam cups, switching light bulbs to LED, investing in solar panels for the parish and our homes, making use of natural light when available, 
using sust sustainable building supplies if we're expanding, creating a parish community garden, carpool, taking public transit or walking to services. The lists are endless. There are many fixes we could talk about today, but those fixes are theoretical unless they're implemented. It takes decisive action by each of us gathered here today. We can decide if we'll continue to be complicit in the destruction of creation, in the marring of the icon of God, or if we will begin to take part in the transfiguration of the cosmos. Should we implement green checklists for parishes? Yes. Should we form parish committees for sustainability? Absolutely. Should we work with our clergy and hierarchs to implement broad environmental changes in each Orthodox jurisdiction? Most assuredly. Should we focus on a Eucharistic, ascetical, liturgical ethos as the ecumenical patriarch calls for? Absolutely. But there's more that needs to be done. What can we do? We can and should recognize the importance of scientific data. This means recognizing and acknowledging that our social, political philosophies might not line up with the data and recon reconciling ourselves to the need to acknowledge ecological crises and their scientific causes in order to participate in the renewal of the life of the world. In other words, if we don't believe in climate change, we need to reevaluate our ideological frameworks of the world. We should also look outward towards other religious communities and organizations that are active in their ecological work. And we have so many excellent models of on the ground renewal efforts in Catholicism, Judaism, Islam, and Buddhism, just, just to name a few. Orthodox Christianity is often thought of as being insular, and the lack of ecumenical dialogue is part of that. And that's, I'm not saying it's all Orthodox Christians, but there is a lack of ecumenical dialogue. We know that. And certainly, the ecumenical patriarch has participated in events that emphasize faith unity on ecological issues. But in general, we don't see active clergy or lay participation in communication with interfaith projects on sustainability, environmental work, and ecological transformation. And this really needs to change. We need to listen to how other faith communities approach ecological work. We need to learn from them. And they need to learn from us why ecology matters in our Orthodox faith traditions, in our Orthodox theologies. We also need to engage with environmentalists, deep green ecologists, and other activists who are continuously participating in the hard daily work of sustainability and renewal. Within the church, there seems to be a fear of embracing secular organizations that work on shared topics of concern. And this shouldn't be the case. We shouldn't perpetuate that, that insularity, that alterity through framing those outside of the church. Rather, we should learn and grow from digesting and implementing the educational resources that secular ecologists and environmental activists can offer us. These are everyday ways in which we can begin to take our eco-theology and make it practical. And perhaps the greatest way we can do this is through recognizing the corrosive nature of capitalism. Greed is not green. Consumption that the unchecked levels of neoliberalism is incompatible with nature and Christianity. We must find ways in which to, for the sake of our planet's renewal and for the sake of our own salvation, push back and destabilize that capitalism, along with its accompanying structures of inequality, racism, sexism, ableism, classism, and so many more isms that are associated with it. And this, of course, will not happen all at once. But at the same time, we cannot wait. The hour is late, spiritually and in terms of the doomsday clock. And in closing, I want us to remember that we're not just sitting on a cliff. We're not just overlooking the destruction of our planet. We're actively participating in its demise. With each piece of plastic we use, every iPhone we buy, every mile we drive in our oversized SUVs, we're all guilty of it, every piece of produce we eat out of season that was picked in the global south by an underpaid laborer and then transported across the globe to various locations for processing and distribution, every bite of beef or chicken that comes from those industrial farms, every paper plate and plastic utensil we throw away rather than recycling during the coffee hour after liturgy, and every single time we turn away from the scientific facts that present us with the horrific truths of climate change, of environmental pollution, of the erasure of whole communities and towns due to extractive and exploitative capitalistic practices. The sheer magnitude of these global crises could throw us into a breathless, apocalyptic frenzy of doom rhetoric about oceans boiling and extinction events, or they could be the existential catalysts that move us to look inward 
and find practical ways of transfiguring the world and ourselves, even if we know it might be too late. Individually, none of us have all the answers, but collectively, we can become a transformative force, both spiritually and socially. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was really wonderful. And I want to actually let you know that I did figure out how to get us on Facebook Live. I had to go a different way. So we, we do have other people out there listening, which is great. Um, yeah, really, really, Sarah, thank you so much for that. Um, I have so many this for me, this is very generative. This is, you know, I mean, one, we're both anthropologists. So I think we, we speak some of the same language that way as well. But, um, you know, I've also like I said, I've, I've been sort of trying to think through some of these things from, you know, an, an, an Oriental uh, Orthodox and Armenian perspective. So this is really, this is really wonderful. Um, before I ask you all of my questions that I have, you know, and I think actually, I was gonna say, like, I think one of the great joys of this job has been that I get to, I get to basically, you know, say, hmm, who would I, who do I want to talk to about this thing that I'm really interested in? I think they should come give a talk at the Zorov Center so that they can definitely, that I can have that conversation. So before I just totally, um, bye, Telly, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, uh, I, before I totally take over and ask you all the questions that are swimming around in my brain, I want to, I want to open it up. And I know that, um, Edward had uh, sent me a message saying that he has a question. So if you want to ask it, you can. And the the rest of you out there, if you are um, formulating something, just let me know and, and um, you can ask your question as well. You there, Edward? I see you're unmuted. Yeah, it's you're you're a little garbled. We can we can barely make you out. The other thing you could do, yeah, as Sarah said, you could you could type your question into the chat if you would like as well. Your your thought and your question that might be a a way to do it to make sure we can understand you. Catching, we're catching just words. Yeah, unfortunately, we were, we were just, yeah, why don't you type it out for us? Yeah. Any, anybody else? Anybody else have, have thoughts? So well, I'll, I'll I'll start one of them while we wait for Edward to type out his question. Which you know, I, I think the the thing that you said about you know, I mean, I've been following some of these COVID conversations as well, and I think there's some really important connections. You know, I mean, obviously some of them have to do with something that I know is a, a sort of specialty of yours as well around materiality, right? There's a kind of there's a, a definite connection between you know, say worries about the you know the, the the shared spoon or communion or you know the 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 presence of Christ in communion and the sort of the material world right I think that's a really important connection and I, I've been thinking about those um, you know Christologically right because that's the one sort of you know obvious long dif difference between the two two traditions and thinking if that you know if that gets us anywhere to be thinking about that so so I, I appreciated that you actually you know, it, it might seem sort of sideways, but I think it's actually really quite connected to be thinking about some of these debates um, that that the Orthodox churches have been having it, during the pandemic uh, and these conversations around the environment. I think that that was really astute. And of course, you know, one, in addition to sort of the ethereal question of materiality, the other connection, as you sort of made very clear, has to do with 
with science, right? With, with, you know, accepting the validity of scientific arguments, whether that be about the way that disease is transmitted or whether that be about the, you know, the human activity uh, that affects the, the climate and the earth, right? Um, and, and I think that's really, really crucial. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of conversations to be had there, but the one thing that I wanted to ask you that I've been, you know, part of why I got so excited about the idea of a kind of environmental theology is actually as a, as a kind of, I don't know how to say this, like, a almost like a workaround of the science, right? Because if you, if you, if you can convince somebody that, you know, it's your Christian duty to care for God's creation, in a way it becomes irrelevant, or this was my thought at least, right? In a way it becomes irrelevant if you believe that, you know, that climate change is caused by human activity, right? If, if, you, if you get somebody to do the same things as if they believe that climate change was caused by human activity because they accept the premise that it is a Christian responsibility to take care of God's creation, then in effect you've gotten them to do the same thing. And, and um, again, thinking through COVID, you know, I've been appallingly surprised that there has been any other Christian discourse about the pandemic other than love thy neighbor. I, I mean, to me, I, I just, this is how I've been saying it. Like how, how is there any other Christian conversation about the pandemic other than, other than love your neighbor, which obviously means put your dang mask on, you know, do, you know, do the things that you need to do. That's what it means to love your neighbor. Right. And I think, you know, so the parallel there is if one can articulate a, a kind of, you know, theology that gets accepted by people, whether that be about, you know, care for God's creation or about loving your neighbor, then in a way, you know, again, not to say that, that, that therefore we deny the science, but in a way, you know, it could perhaps make it, you know, irrelevant in terms of a kind of rhetorical persuasive uh, manner. And I, I don't know if you've, what you what you think about that or or if you know if we need a two-pronged approach or you know if one you know if one has to sort of accede to certain scientific truths in order to to be mobilized to do this kind of engaged work you're talking about i it, this is a, it's a complicated question right because if we can get them to you know if we can get people to wear their masks and we can get people to care about climate change without believing the facts um, about COVID or climate change, right? And in a way, we've done our work because people are 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 listening. On the other hand, what well, like what would an ethicist say about that? I'm not an ethicist, so I can't like right. Is that is that ethical? I don't know. Is that moral? I don't I don't know. Right? It's so there's. It, I think it comes down to right like the way a person actually understands themselves in relationship to the world. Right? It's an it's an ontological question, really. How you understand yourself in relation to the world in relationship to the world is how you act. And so like, for, for example, you know, I work with row core communities and I've, I've worked with row core communities who have done outreach um, among impoverished communities. And I often hear them saying, I'm doing this for Christ, right? So say they're feeding someone, right? I'm doing this. And they'll say this to the people that they're, they're helping, right? They're feeding. They'll say, I'm feeding you because by feeding you, I feed Christ. Right? Is that is that ethic, is that moral? Is that ethical? It shouldn't the imperative be to feed the per, right to feed the person, right? And so I wonder if it's like an it's if it's an issue if it's an ontological issue, right? Mm. I don't know. Yeah. Because as you as you clearly stated, I'm an anthropologist. I'm not a theologian. I can masquerade as one very well. Yeah, but I do that too. I did that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that's really, you know, but this is the, I mean, I think you're, 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 you're also pointing, you know, and, and I, I think, you know, some of my specific anthropological background of being a, you know, a sort of um, unrepentant Assadian, right, which, which you're sort of, you're pointing with that ethics question, you're pointing a little bit to, to the question of intention, right? Like, yeah. and, and I think for a certain kind of, especially theological conception of ethics, that intention is crucial, right? That absolutely is crucial. But from 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 a perspective of en of engagement, you know, if you're doing, you know, you 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 bend the knee, you know, in order to become a humble, prayerful person, you know, and and if you keep bending your knee and you keep saying, you know, I'm doing this, and you keep praying, then you know, 
hopefully, right, in that kind of Aristotelian understanding, you know, it, it, hopefully, eventually, you become that humble, prayerful person because you keep bending the knee. You know, so I, I you know, I, 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 I'm with you, you know, there's a, there's a sense in which certain, you know, it, it's a kind of, you know, the intention isn't in line with the action. And is it, is it really Christian charity if you're just doing it because, you know, I mean, this is, this is the question about sort of like, in a way, that's the question of hell, right? Like if, if I'm doing good deeds or if I'm a good, if I'm a good Christian because I'm worried about going to hell, am I a good Christian? Right. Um, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, your own price time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it's, it's, a, I think it's a really, you know, it's, 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 it's on the one hand, it's a sort of theological conundrum, but you know, I, I don't know, I guess the other part of me is like, if if there are portions of the church who are are just we're we're, we're never going to get to to accede to certain you know philosophical yeah. scientific positions truths we might even say yeah. then um you know then 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 the then, then the world's in trouble you know um America is in trouble right now because we can't get people to wear masks right so um, whether or not you do it out of love of neighbor or you do it because you think that actually that's how a, you know, a, a virus is transmitted. I mean, I'd like to see the numbers go down. Right. I mean, that's the sort of, that's the other, yeah. that's the, that's, that's the other part of that. So, yeah. But I think you really, you, you, you sort of nail it both with your, your response to what I said and, you know, and, and from the outset with the science, you know. But I guess the other, maybe my other corollary of that to ask you is, you know, can we use some of this theology to then push, you know, if, 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 if there's a sort of ethical conundrum to bypassing the science, can we then maybe use the theology to push people towards it? You know, is, is that a possibility? And what, 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 might, what might that look like? We hope, right? We hope. Yeah. And if, if, if there's a way to do it, you know, Telly, who has left us, would know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know. I was like, oh, he listened. He got. He, he took your wisdom, and then I was waiting for him to throw some some wisdom back at us here. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. I. It's. I think Ed, Edward. Do you finally have sound? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I had to reboot my computer. Okay. Oh, Andrew, now, now I could hear your voice really. But. Uh... Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, can I can I ask my question? Yeah, please, or please. Yeah, no, I think we would we would just keep doing this. So please ask. You know, other people should get in here. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, uh, kind of. Uh, this is a you, your view of the world is kind of grim. I mean, I at least uh, you could give us a few good examples. Uh, <laughs> now, on the other hand, since we on the grim side. Uh, uh, you, you see, the Bible has a lot of violence and uh, other times stories, apocalypses, I mean, the, the Noah's, uh, the Noah's story, I mean, God basically in Exodus, uh, in Genesis, actually, uh, he says, I'm, I'm sorry, but this, this is not working out, this world, I'm going to destroy it and start over again. Uh, now, the, the other idea was that at one point, because again, it was garbled, St. John, I think he was saying how, how we should consider the world as a, as a living icon. It's, it's a very good image, and uh, now on the other hand, of course, the, the the idea of itself of icon is is controversial. I mean, there, there, there are ways to say that uh, you know, looking looking at icons is really not the way to look at the world. There, there's this dichotomy between what is what is human and what is divine, and the icon represents just the human part. And uh, and lastly, just just I mean, you're doing uh, you you're giving those suggestions of, of what to do and and do not use too much plastic, but but now on the floor in your room I see a wall to wall type of carpet. <laughs> you know what? I would I would try to 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 not have that there. I mean, if we worrying about uh, phone cups, uh, you know, the, the carpeting, the wall to wall type is is where we should start with. What are you oh, Edward, I completely agree with you, and I wish it wasn't in here, but I didn't, I didn't build this house, and I don't own it, so. Well, is, is that a bad excuse? Isn't that a bad excuse? It well, is, well, it is, own, and it is, you know, it's a terrible right. excuse, right? I'm complicit, you're complicit, we're all complicit every single day, right? I'm, I'm, on, an, I'm on an iMac right now. I bought an iMac. We know the, the work practices of, of Apple, right, in China with the Uyghurs. We know, right? We're all complicit. 
this is a call for me as much as it's a call for anyone else, right? I need to look inward and see what I can do every day that I live. And it's a struggle. It's absolutely a struggle. And as I said, it's not something that's going to come immediately, right? But we have to think every day what we can do. You know, we have to make those tiny changes every day. And those amount, right? Thea Kredoff says, you know, like they feel tiny. They feel small. They feel insignificant, these, these changes we make. But every change adds up. Every single change adds up, right? Now, in terms of iconography, you know, and, and I'm speaking from the Eastern Orthodox tradition, we see those as, as, as windows to the divine, right? And, and if St. John is calling this a, a divine image of Christ, then I'm going to take it as a divine image of Christ, right? The, the earth. And if, if we think about uh, Father John Crisavigis, right, who's the ecumenical um, patriarch's ecological advisor, he also calls the earth um, the divine image of God. Right. And I take that I take that very seriously from him, who who's an excellent materialist, by the way. Right, but but um, I mean, there, 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 there's a history of iconoclasm, and very very uh, well educated people and well intended people who are also uh, right. But I think uh, you see the, the problem is that uh, Jesus or Christ having two natures, the, the the human nature and the divine nature, and the icons represents only the human nature and we could only have a glimpse like like a window to the, the divine nature but uh, we should not take them too far we should uh, uh, I think uh, we, we, we're missing the point that this is uh, that we are in the image of God it, it's like uh, when you when you for example um, I mean the closest that uh, I could think of is Hamlet uh, when, when uh, you see Hamlet is is is, is that character in the book that Shakespeare created, but also many times I'm, I'm sure that I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll just meet him on the street, uh, but he is still there, he is on the page. And, and I think we, we are overdoing uh, the part with, uh, with uh, getting close to the divine uh, in, in this world. Um, I don't know, let me ask you a question. Sure. Since you've asked me so many. W would you kill someone? Would you kill someone? Would you yeah, would you kill someone? Would you, Edward, kill someone? Well, no, unless he's... No, so why? 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 Yeah, I mean, because we, we, we this, um, um, it, it's like, um, we are not sure of what is, you see, it's, it's basically a self-defense. You see, our actions are self-defense. Okay, here's why we, here's what, but here, Edward, here's why we wouldn't murder someone, right? Because we are made in the divine image of God, right? And the incarnation shows us that. And the divine image of God is, is everywhere. The Holy Spirit right, but, is everywhere but, and fills all things, God right? So God a lot if, of people. if we are not going to murder each other, why are we murdering the earth, right? It doesn't make sense. If, 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 if Christ showed us the incarnation, right? Right. There's no need for it. But I, I love I love your I love your questions, Edward. I love it when somebody gives me a run for my money, and I appreciate you so much. Sure. And the, you know, and I, and I I would just hop in there that you know I mean the 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 theology of the icon is a really crucial entry into into this question. Um, so you know I think you've put your finger on something by 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 pointing that out. So yeah. Just I mean just just to say one more thing. For example, Judaism doesn't have icons, and and no. Islam doesn't have another, and they do not have those, those issues of of representing. I mean, right now we're talking about the black Jesus, and and, and this is a very legitimate point. Uh, we we made Jesus very much uh, uh, like our own image instead of us being in His image, and uh, if and any Armenian church, uh, Christ and the saints, they look Armenian. In Greek churches, they look Greek. You, you go to to Catholic churches, they, they look Northern Europeans, and uh, that's not a good thing. In other words, the, uh, the the old Hebrews, I think they figured it out. No images, no images allowed, because uh, because the divine nature is uh, unrepresentable. Right, it's the uncreated light, right? In Judaism, we have to kun alam, which is the re the renewal of the earth, right? And they have. We have excellent models in Judaism to follow for ecological repair, and which is which is why I mentioned it because I th I think we could we could learn so much 
from our Jewish friends about how to repair the earth in ways that are, are not focused on our own salvation, right? But are focused on, on the, the reparations here and now, what's mattering now. Thank you. That's, I mean, that's, this is a, an important part of the, the theological conversation. I, I love um, what Zar is sort of asking and suggesting in the, in the chat though, which is uh, a, a nice question about, um, you know, what, what are those steps? And I think there's, there's two, there's two things I'm going to, I'm going to interpret Zar's question a little bit. And I think on the one hand, there's a question about those sort of first practical steps, some of which you've, you've hinted at Sarah, but the other, the other question that maybe I'm going to read into, and so I'll make it my own. That is inspired by Zars is is a question of clericalism, actually, because you know I, I don't know how you know how you know there there's more activity, say, for deacons in the Eastern Orthodox Church than there is in the Armenian Church. But what Zar is pointing to here is that you know there are there are hierarchical institutions and positions largely we're talking about the clergy but also you know parish council right there are there are gatekeepers in our individual parishes that are you know that are, are going to be the sort of stakeholders right and so there's there's two things you know how do you convince the parish council to not use styrofoam cups and also how do you convince the the priest that you know it's okay to talk about these things you know yeah, I, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head with clericalism because we ex we often expect the priest to lead, right? We expect them to be the example for us. We expect the bishop to be the example for us. And we have to remember that the church is made up of people, right? Of lots and lots of lay people, specifically. And we actually have to be the ones to push them, right? I've, you know, I've witnessed parish councils and my parts of my family have been involved in parish councils. And it's not, it's definitely not easy, right? And I would recommend, um, I would re recommend first of all getting that greening handbook because I and and I can send you a link to it. Um, yeah, that's what because Zara actually had it, asked as well about the title of that. That'd be great, right? It's excellent. It offers it offers um, practical solutions, right? Ways to engage with your priest if they're sort of hesitant or reticent to start some ecological um, changes in the parish, and and then think about what you want to do in your daily life. Right. So, for example, um, we have commemoration loaves in the Eastern Orthodox tradition that we, we have prosper that we take home with us. Right. We have a little bit in the mornings with with water, with holy water. Um, and my parish was giving them to me in a plastic, a little plastic bag. Right. These little commemorative loaves with the, the icon of the Theotokos impressed on. So I, I went and I, I bought from someone who handmade these a little linen bag. And I said to my husband, who's a subdeacon, I said, would you please give this to the priest? Um, I want I want the loaf in this linen bag from now on. I don't want any more plastic. I'm tired of this plastic, right? Because then I have all these plastic bags, right, that I've like kept at home and stacked. And I like, what am I supposed to do with them, right? So you know, and then people in my parish would see that, and they're and they'd say, hey, where did you get that really cool linen bag with a you know, there's an icon on the front of it, and like that's really neat. It's an all embroidered, hand embroidered. And, and so people were starting to buy them, right? It's it's a trans it's a transformative thing to make one tiny change in your own life, right? It it can impact other people in your parish. And so if you bring your own mug to coffee hour, right, and somebody there, one of the old timers, like, hey, why do you have a coffee mug? And you say, well, you know, styrofoam lasts forever in the environment, and you don't say anything else, and you just walk away with your coffee mug. That makes a change. That has an impact, right? Whether you see it that day or later on, it will have some sort of impact. And so there are tiny ways each and every day that we can make those transformations in the parish. Um, and, you know, it's, it's it, with parish council, if you can get on the parish, if you want to be on the parish council, first of all, I'm not sure you want to. <laughs> but if you want to, you know, and you feel that you feel called, you feel compelled by the Holy Spirit to be on the parish council then by all means, if you feel like you're going to make a change, right? Um, that's one way of doing it. Another way is to just really sit there, you know, have your, have your priest over, sit down and say, look, there's, a, I have some, I have some concerns. I have some concerns that I feel are part of, are part of um, the salvation of myself and the world. And here they are. And they could be tiny things like, Hey, maybe we should just switch to led lights. They don't cost that much more. They last longer. Um, you know, they're better, they're better, they say they're better on people's eyes, which I've found is true once I replaced with LED lights. Um, something like that. It's a, it, 
it's the small changes that actually make the difference. I really appreciate that. And I, cause one of the things that I, I found very helpful in the Eastern Orthodox environmental theology that I've looked at is the, the understanding of, you know, one, one way of approaching it is through the kind of ascetic tradition, right? Which also is like, that puts a heavy emphasis on, like, you don't get to perfection, like one, you never get there. And two, you certainly don't get there like today or overnight. You get there by doing little things over time, struggling with it, you know, like what can, and, and reflecting inward on yourself as well. When, you know, when you were saying earlier, like, this is something that we all have to do, you know, I have to, you know, turn inward and think about what are the things that I can do, right? One, you turn inward on yourself and say, what is it that I can do? And two, you enact small things, you know, and work on yourself little by little. So, I, I mean, in a way, what you're describing is, is very much a kind of set of, you know, uh, ascetic practices as well, which has one, been one of the things I found super, super useful in trying to think about how, how to move that green theology into any kind of practical place, right? That, that to me seems like a pretty easy interface, right? Like, okay, asceticism requires action on my individual part. Yeah. And, 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 and there's such, you know, some of the changes are so simple, right? We have the fasting rules in the church already and, and the patriarch, he says, Hey, ramp them up. Like just be more mindful. Right. You know, and, and we're so forgetful, right? It's so easy. It's so easy to be at work on a, on a Wednesday and totally forget that you're not supposed to have dairy. In your cup. It's so easy. Right. And it's, it takes mindfulness. It really is about being mindful and, and, and thinking constantly of ways to make a change. And that's really hard. Yeah. So Joyce had sent me a, just a comment that I don't even know if she really uh, intended publicly or not, but she had a question about education. And I, this is something that's been on my mind in part because I had the, I was very lucky. I was at, um, I wasn't an official guest, but I snuck into part of the, the most recent Hulky summit um, that was on uh, on the environment. You know, the, the, the green ecumenical patriarch has called over the over the decades several really high level, wonderful meetings. And I, I managed to just I, I didn't I wasn't allowed to go all the days, but I got to go for like one day of the meetings, which was like awesome. I was like, great, that's more than enough for me. And this 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 version, the Hulky Three Summit, was specifically about education, and I I took that actually as a, an understanding that okay, over the decades we've developed all of this stuff, but it's not in our parishes yet. We got to get it in our parishes. But I I also was sort of struck by the the limitations of the idea of education as action, and this is something obviously as a teacher that I think about a lot, right? I mean, like on the one hand, we 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 teachers, we professors want to think, oh well, of course I'm doing something. Teaching is of course an action, um, but on the other hand, it 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 stands sort of part way between, you know, between just the ideas and you know, uh, changing your light bulbs, right? Um, so I, I wonder, you know, what you think about the sort of the role of, of education, especially, you know, we've, we talked about it a little bit already, but really, you know, like kind of concerted educational efforts and where that falls in this kind of engaged um, set of practices that you're, you're really pushing us towards. You know, I think that I've been thinking a lot about this because when I teach classes on anthropology, I, you know, I always say that anthropologists now, right, not not the, the colonialist anthropologists of the past, but anthropologists now are really engaged in sort of activism work, right? So we see that in people that work in particular communities that need higher um, visibility representation, right? And so they, they work towards that as activists on their behalf. And so... I can go into a classroom and I can talk to my students about how the issues, right? I can talk to them about the gender wage gap. I can talk to them about sexism in the workplace. I can talk to them about all of that, right? But if I'm not actually doing anything about it or showing them, they're just going to get it up here and they're not going to get it in here, right? And it's not going to actually be transformative. Um, what the, I mean, I'll send this out to the people who want it, but... Yale actually has a really great sort of um, interfaith uh, sustainability ecology group that actually works. They, they're not just about talking, they're working 
Um, they have uh, community gardens. They do activism and outreach. They're actually doing things. And that's that would be a model that would be amazing to see implemented across, across the U.S. and across the world. Will it happen? I don't know. <laughs> it's good, right? Probably not, sadly. But we can hope that it will. Um, and there, there are smaller community universities, community colleges that have these sort of um, engaged um, participatory programs as well. And I think highlighting those is really important because they're actually doing the work besides just hearing it. Mm. Um, and, you know, if we could if we could get these kind of things in motion in Orthodox um, uh, parochial schools, um, in our, our communities, in our OFC communities, that would be awesome. Yeah, that was my follow-up question. Like, how do you do that? You know, because that, that was the that was sort of the explicit topic of this last Halki Summit is, you know, education yeah. in the parishes. You know, again, like, you know, Christoph Gies' work is brilliant. How do you how do you take that to the parishes? And, and then, you know, and then I think, you know, the next step then is take it to the parishes so that things happen in the parishes. You know, do you, do you have, have you, like... Do you, do you have thoughts on what that model would look like in the parishes? Like what kind of, like, is it just Sunday school? Is it like adding, you know, like green things to Sunday school or what, what would, you know, what would that like parish level green education look like? You know, I, I think it could almost be something like, you know, so Apple has their own university, right? And I, I know an anthropologist who works for it. And I was thinking about this the other day. It's like this great model. They have these week long seminars and then, they're done, right? They're just for their Apple employees. That would be great to do in our parish, right? Where we have somebody do a seminar. And, and the wonderful thing about our digital world now is that we don't have to do any carbon footprints and more emissions with flying somebody in, right? We can just have somebody come on a Zoom meeting and talk about sustainable ways to engage the parish. I think that we could have something like that, like a week-long seminar where people are engaged and thinking about ways they can make a difference and then actually doing that work alongside of the information that they're learning each day in a seminar. I think that would be really helpful. I think first of all, though, before you could even do that, right, you'd have to get your priest and your parish council on board. And that's the really big work. And that's the interpersonal work that you have to do, hmm. right? That's that, that's that sitting down one-to-one -one over a cup of coffee and chatting about your, your, your concerns. Hmm. Any, any other folks out there have, have have we now spun off to something maybe that inspired somebody else to ask something um otherwise i think i just have to make sure to uh call you and check in with you more often you know you candace and i need to sit down more often i think is also the point of what i've learned here <laughs> always yeah <laughs> anyone else have we have we got your questions i hope so well if if that is the case let's let's give Dr. Riccardi sorts another nice round of, you can use your, I love to, this is my favorite reaction. It's way better than the thumbs up. Oh yes, uh, Sylvie, can you can you just type in the title of the um, the Kruger book that you've mentioned? Yeah, um, I believe it's called Greening the Parish. Let me, let me look it up really quick just to make sure because I don't want to get the title wrong because I have so many greening books <laughs> that, and they all have green, right? Yeah. The title, it's like that's the most important word to have which is fine, but it's just, <laughs> oh, there it is. it's Greening the Orthodox Parish, a handbook for Christian ecological practice. Orthodox Parish. I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it in the chat for you all. Oh, great. Okay. You got it. Perfect. Thank you. I just sent it to you, Chris. Send it to everyone else. Everyone, perfect. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. And I just want to, um, because several of our environmental events got kind of pushed, and I mentioned at the beginning, but I want to, I just want to mention again, and you'll, you'll be, if you're on my Zorab list, you'll be getting uh, emails about this coming up. But the, um, what was intended to be the final event of the season actually again becomes the final event just of a much longer season um, will be um, September 18th. It's going to be 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern time 
Um, and our my co-sponsor organization, who's sort of actually they're, they're, they've kind of taken the lead, is called Graymore Ecumenical and Interreligious Institute. Um, they're also based in New York. Um, and we're going to have a, a panel discussion that um, very nicely and alliteratively is called Ecology and Ecumen Ecumenicity, i.e. being ecumenical. Um, that is, of course, the Graymore's sort of mission. Um, and um, the, the panelists include actually um, uh, Dr. John, Reverend Dr. John Krasov Gies, who, who we've been speaking about, um, uh, includes uh, very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas uh, at the uh, Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary, uh, Dr. Don Notewer, uh, a leading Catholic environmental ethicist. Um, Reverend Dr. David Vasquez Levy, uh, the president, president of Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, multi-denominational seminary. Um, and I feel like the um, total uh, interloper in that I also will be on that panel. Um, so I, I, if, if this has sparked your interest at all, I would um, encourage you to, um, to join us. And, and like I said, you'll be getting those emails from me if you're on the Zorab list pretty soon because... Um, that's a, a less than a month away now, and it, it, it promises to be a really exciting conversation that, um, you know, we, we've been doing a little bit tonight, actually, because we're, we're, you know, we've got Eastern and Oriental Orthodox here, but um, really kind of trying to have this conversation uh, among different Christian denominations to really think about what what this would look like for for the, the church with the, the biggest C possible. So, um Again, thank you, Sarah, one more time. This is this is a treat, um, and I'm glad that we did eventually get it on Facebook. And um, everybody else, have a lovely evening, yeah, and I hope so to see much, you soon. Chris. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Oh.